I'm Richard Hyde, and I'm here today to talk about what I've called the Garmin generation. The whole talk was really based on an article I read about three months ago, which was a big debate that's going on in education about whether we should teach skills or knowledge. And I think it's all based on Mr. Gove's interventions in education, but it, it started me thinking about how that applies to the workplace, and should we be teaching skills or knowledge? Sh be because we live in an always-on um, in society now, we don't necessarily to need to teach knowledge anymore. We can rely on people just going and finding what they want when they need it. But the risk of that, of course, is that people lose the ability to save, process, and retrieve knowledge when they need it. So I thought there's basis there for something quite interesting. So what I'm going to do is sort of take a little bit of a back step to see what's happening with knowledge, um, talk a little bit about the debate that's been going on and how that applies to the workplace, um, look, about, look at a bit of research about what, what it might be happening to the brain with, with all this changing how knowledge is, knowledge is delivered, and then maybe a few ideas about how learning design might need to be adapted based on some of the results that we're seeing. There's a link there to the talk if you want to, but at the end I can show that at the end as well, so uh, there might be some homework to do, so you might need to go back and look at it again. So this is my tweet of the day, really. Uh, a bit of a play on navigation. Where are we going with long-term knowledge? Because I don't know. To start with, I really, really want to sort of stand back a bit and look at the big picture about big data. You know, what, what is actually happening out there in the field? Now, I, I chose the topic of navigation as a bit of a theme here, because I, I do a lot of walk in the outdoors. And the, the knowledge about how to use a map and memorizing locations has almost vanished because we use these things nowadays. You know, we can walk wherever we want, and these things will always get us back to where we started. You know, it's a Garmin or your navigation device in the car. So I'd like to ask you a question about who uses a navigation device in a car when they're traveling? Could you just put your hands up? OK, keep your hand up if you think your spatial awareness has improved as a consequence of using that. I'm hoping everyone's going to put their hand down. And that's really interesting. Now. The fact that we're having to, the, all that ability, that need to save that knowledge has been taken away with us. Has the skill to navigate actually, actually diminished? That was my first observation. I'm going to give you a few examples now of incidents. Um, a very good friend of mine, I won't say who it is, um, had a business trip to Manchester a few years ago, typed in the address into his um, Tom Tom, set off, arrived at the street, got out, realized that. The meeting was actually in Liverpool, and he'd gone to Manchester instead. As I say, a very good friend of mine now doesn't rely on his Garmin so much. He relies on skill and common sense as a consequence. Another great example of poor navigation. Uh, we talk about people who go traveling to find themselves. Well, this woman actually did. Um, she was on a, on a trip to Iceland on a, on a coach going to visit some sites. Everyone got off the bus. They got back on again. Um, but in the interim, the woman actually got changed into a different set of clothes. So the rest of the party didn't actually recognize her when she got back on. So they formed a search party, and the she joined the search party, searching for herself. And I think it took them till 3 in the morning to realize that they were looking for the person who was in the party already. So, you know, there's something going on there. Final example here is this. It, it looks quite spurious, but this woman was on a trip to, on a cruise to Hawaii, um, got shipwrecked, fell unconscious, landed on a desert island. She was there for seven years, um, but she scribed something in the sand, which some youth in the US actually found on Google Earth, and she was rescued. It's a fake, but I just love the story. <laughs> but it just shows you where technology can work for us, and maybe other incidents where it doesn't necessarily work for us. I mean, data as well. I mean, you, you, we've all heard about this growth, this almost unbelievable growth in data. This is, if you're a bit of a geek, I would recommend looking at this report. It's big, but there's some fascinating insights into where data is going by uh, Mary Meeker. I mean, just look at some of the figures here. I mean, the ones I look quite like are Fitbit, if you're into these fitness apps. The number of steps been, that have been recorded are the distance from the Earth to Saturn to date. Um, likewise, my fitness pal there has effectively helped people lose 100 million pounds. I mean, that's, 
at least one oil tanker. I mean, it's a lot of fat. And the prediction going forward, this is another page from the report. I mean, data is accumulating 50% year on year. And th these are zettabytes, which is one million terabytes. The prediction is that the number of photos that will be uploaded to the internet at the end of this year will be 1.6 billion a day. I mean, just think about that. Uh, uh, it, it's almost incomprehensible. This is what we're dealing with. I mean, this, this is the web, but you know, it, knowledge is knowledge. And people are in the workplace are, are getting bombarded with, with more and more data that they need to deal with. Consequently, what we're dealing with everywhere, really, is, is attention span. I remember when, when I was designing e-learning back in the, in the 90s, we used to say you had to engage someone within 20 seconds of starting a course. Otherwise, they're going to get bored. Well, look at this. I mean, this is from the Telegraph. How many people will leave a website within two to three seconds if it hasn't loaded? 50%. I mean, talk about boredom threshold. It's, it's inc incredible how, how things have changed. General fatigue as well. Can you estimate how much web content people actually read on a web page? And think about relating that to an e-learning course. You know, if they're only going to, are they skim reading? Well, they are. If this is what they're doing on the internet, you can be damn sure that they're doing it when they're going through e-learning material, which possibly isn't as interesting to them. And then what about video? I mean, video is supposedly one of the most engaging media formats we can use. But the percentage of people who will quit a video after 30 seconds, you've lost a third. After a minute, it's 100%. Again, this is web, but relate that to what, you, what we're doing in the workplace. Um, and even if the figures are, are like this, then they're going to be possibly close. And then really relating this to the workplace, this is a really interesting study over, over a number of years by Robert Kelly showing the percentage of information that knowledge workers, as in people nowadays doing jobs that um, require knowledge on, on, on the job, what do they actually need in their head to do their job well? And just look at how that's going down. You know, back in the 80s, maybe you, you need jobs are a lot more uh, um, apprenticeships. Um, there was a lot of jobs which did need a body of knowledge to actually do. But nowadays, we think on the fly. We don't actually need a lot of information here because we can, we can gather it from other means. So what does this mean in terms of, of learning design? Are, what, are, are we actually adapting to these sort of facts and figures that we're seeing here? So out of this came the debate, I think. You know, this is what we're up against. Um, and this was the article I read which really prompted this talk today. Has, everyone, has anyone come across this book? Daisy Christodoulou um, published this last year, I believe. Very controversial. Um, she is a traditional teacher, or, or she's a, an academic researcher now, but she was a teacher. Um, and she's very much against this, this always-on generation. So what she's proposed is she's actually against what she calls the seven myths of education. So actually she's, re she's re repressing these as concepts, um, which does seem to be the way that education is going. So I'll just give you a few, few moments to look at those. I mean, this is education, but I think there are <laughs> there's very close similarities into what we're, the channels we're being pushed around down uh, in the workplace. The one I really sums it for me is you can always look it up. You know, we don't actually need to teach them anything because they've got a search engine. They can go and find it. So that's, that's where she's coming from. What this has sort of generated in my mind is a, a number of questions that I need to think about to apply this to the workplace. You know, what, what is relevant nowadays? Is anything relevant? Um, if I am going to give people knowledge, what are the pieces they actually need to do their job? How can I possibly determine that if it's changing so rapidly? How should that be delivered? You know, it, we've got such a multitude of ways of getting knowledge to people now. 
what is relevant? What's going to actually appeal to them the most? And am I just wasting my time at the end of the day because they can, they're just going to go and find it when they need it? You know, these are big questions that really define our role as, as learning developers. So, I've just got a, a, a few videos now. I'm, I'm not actually going to show you these two because I'm like a good teacher. I'm going to give you some homework. I'll actually go away and watch these because they're quite long. But on the left, we've got Daisy um, putting her case forward, promoting the, as she says, the power of long-term memory has been absolutely critical to solving even the most basic problems. You know, this is a traditional educationalist viewpoint. Um, she does quote a number of Ofsted reports in her book, which are quite amusing. Um, Ofsted are very uh, applauding the use of puppet making for teaching Romeo and Julia instead of actually reading the book, which you know some might agree with, but you know it, that's her side. That, that's her side. Steve Wheeler, I'm sure many of you'll be um, aware, is very much at the opposite end of the scale. Um, fame, la quite like the quote from him where he says, "Well, Latin names for fish are only useful if you're, you know, you're doing trivial pursuit, but actually not much use in practical life." But he has a very good point there, saying that computers actually just, just get rid of a load of um, stuff which we don't actually need to do and allow us to focus on higher order activities like assimilation, evaluation, um, application. You know, why should we need to learn all this stuff? So that's the academic side of things. Like I say, watch those two clips after the session. The two I am going to show you are more in the, in the cultural space. Um, Nicholas Carr, if you're not aware of him, is, a, is a quite a high-profile writer and commentator on what the internet is doing to our brains. Um, a few points there. And then we've got our, the nation's favorite intellectual, Stephen Fry, again arguing that the internet poses no threat. It's just a natural evolution that is um, the way that our brains have evolved anyway. So we're just going to watch um, short clips of both of these now and just to gain a, an insight an instant message with a link to a funny photo, which of course you have to share. And now you're reading your Facebook news wall, which sends you to a video of a panda bear attacking a kid. And now you're reading Wikipedia to learn everything you can about the violent behavior of panda bears. And this is what three minutes on the internet can be like. We live like this all the time, and it has to have some kind of effect on us. The net is making us more superficial as thinkers. That is Nicholas Carr. He is the author of The Shallows, What the Internet is Doing to Our Brains. To understand this whole thing better, we need to go way back in time to, say, like, the prehistoric age. You wanted to know everything going on around you because the more you knew about your surroundings, the less likely you were to get attacked by a predator. And there's even evidence that our brains release some dopamine, pleasure-producing uh, neurotransmitter chemical, to reward us for seeking out and finding new information. So getting distracted felt good and helped us stay alive. But the problem is that nowadays, predators aren't much of an issue, but we still have the same brains. And also, there's the internet, which is... It's an incredibly information-rich environment uh, that the net creates for us, and that's why we use it so much. I, I mean, sounds, pictures, words, text, and what this tends to do... I'll pause out there. I mean, the quote I really like from him is that the, the internet shortchanges our intellect. And he finds it quite insulting that this has effectively replaced a big part of his brain. Um, and he, he, he does sense a, a risk that it's going to change the way we can actually process knowledge. Let's now watch um, Stephen to see what his viewpoint is. I think the volume needs to go up on this one. He's a bit quiet. <laughs> there are now people in their mid to getting on to advanced teens um, who have never known, obviously, uh, a world without the web. In fact, there may be 20 people, 20 year, 20 year olds who've never known anything but that. Have they developed strange thumbs? Do they have peculiar ways of talking and listening? Do their eyes glaze over when they have to concentrate for more than 30 seconds? No, I don't believe any of that. I'm not particularly negative or pessimistic about the social qualities, the linguistic qualities, the concentration qualities of Generation Web, as they're called. Um, I honestly believe that if you were to go back into the 1920s and take an ordinary semi-educated 15-year-old and place him next to an ordinary semi-educated semi 15-year-old now, you would find the one now knows more, understands more, is more social. Well, I would argue against that. I think teenagers nowadays have got strange attitudes and have got strange thumbs. But uh, So you can see there there's, there's a discrepancy. There's an argument that's going on, and that really summarizes, I think, 
both sides of the, of the equation. So let's look behind the scene. Let's get some solid evidence here about what is going on in our brains. Um, I pulled together some bits and bobs from media, um, from brain research here, and some of my own ideas as well. Well, that trusted daily, the male, has identified a new psychotic illness called digital dementia amongst the young. Um, attention span um, has actually diminished, and teachers actually back this up. I'm not sure if you've got kids, you probably, maybe you have noticed a difference. I think I probably have among some, peop some, some people's kids that I know. Um, their behavior's changing. You know, they're always wanting to get back online. You know, they, they cannot stay focused on, on one thing for more than 10 seconds. And these are the workers of the future. You know, uh, do we need to be, be, uh, be worried about this? As it stands, I did trawl the internet for research on this. It remains scarce. There's no definite evidence that um, this is actually affecting them in, in any major way. But I think it's something we definitely do need to be cautious of. <coughs> but be warned. This is a quote by a very famous, a very famous intellectual who warns us that this invention will produce forgetfulness in the minds of those who learn it. So it's certainly worth heeding. However, this was Socrates. I mean, a very interesting parallel that he, he was actually talking about writing as being a threat to the spoken word and, and, and worrying about exactly the same issue that we're worrying about now. And what happens? Well, did writing destroy our intellect? Possibly not. Well, definitely not. We're still here. Um, I just thought that was quite an interesting quote from almost two and a half thousand years ago. So what's happened? You know, has the web actually made us more linear in our thinking? Or is it the other way around? Has the web just been designed to fit in with the, how our mind is evolving? You know, as our mind becomes more nonlinear, has the web been designed to fit in with that? I'd just like to kind of get you involved again. A quick straw poll here. Are you a linear or nonlinear thinker? If you were desi designing a, or, or planning a party for your little darling, um, how would you do it? I think that's the aftermath, by the way, not, not the start. How would you plan it? I'm going to show you sh two images now. I'd just like a quick show of hands as to what would be the most appealing way of planning this party. Would it be like that? Would it be a list? How many people would plan it like that? It's about 50% possibly, maybe a bit more. How many non-linear thinkers have we got? How many people think like in colors? Not so many, and that's quite typical. I, I, I don't think we are quite there yet in terms of non-linear thinking. Now, I, I think we'd like to think we're really creative and wacky, but I think underpinning it all is, the, is, is that need to create lists to, have, to base it on knowledge rather than this, which is more of a skillful approach, I think. So I sort of thought then about, okay, let me think of a job role which absolutely depends on knowledge, like a huge body of knowledge that historically is absolutely essential for doing that job well. Well, the only one, or the best one I could certainly think of is this guy. He has the knowledge. It's a phenomenal test of memory and the examinations are the hardest in the world for, for taxi drivers. They're renowned. Three quarters of people fail. What does it involve? Well, in Roman times, the knowledge was actually quite straightforward. Probably 10 streets. You could memorize that in 20 minutes. Nowadays, it's a little bit more difficult. We have 25,000 streets within six miles of Charing Cross. Now, these poor trainees have to turn up for what's called appearances. I think they can do any, any number of those within a three-year period. They get challenged to find the, the most appropriate route between two points. Not only do they need to describe the roads, but also the junctions, the lights, which way they turn, and points of interest along the way. Tourist sites, pubs, you name it. What murder scenes, I mean, I don't know, but it's a phenomenal achievement. Now, what's going on there? You know, can, can we take that body of knowledge away from them and just give them a Garmin? I don't think so. You know, I don't think that's ever going to happen because there's so, much, there's so much skill in interpreting that knowledge based on 
the person who gets in to that vehicle. I don't know if you've seen this, but research has shown that the hippocampus of taxi drivers is bigger than normal individuals. You know, it actually grows to cater for that knowledge. I mean, the brain is so malleable, it changes its format. I mean, isn't that, isn't that fascinating? Uh, I'm not sure how many other job roles that is actually uh, appropriate for. So what, what I did then, I thought, well, does having that knowledge actually improve their skill in other aspects of their life? You know, can I, can I here promote that knowledge as being a real benefit to higher order learning? Well, this is the sort of feedback I got from the people who've done the course. They, they're using things like acronyms to remember place names, to remember routes. This was really interesting. This, this individual really thought that having the knowledge had made him a, a, a better business decision maker. Um, better people skills, obviously all the talking as well, um, and smarter work techniques. I'm not sure how that correlates, but it's quite an interesting thought, is that process of learning basic knowledge has actually made that individual um, a higher order learner and improved their general sort of skill base. There were exceptions. <laughs> this individual obviously thought that <laughs> some taxi drivers don't really get the knowledge properly. Okay, so what about the workplace then? Okay, look, we've seen a bit of background, a bit, a bit of research there, but what's going on? Can we apply this to the workplace? Uh, and w what do we need to do differently? Well, if we think about traditional approach to skills-led and knowledge-led learning, how we might approach those in the workplace. If you look at the left, left-hand column there, skills-led is generally more collaborative, so we might have a a starter where we just engage a group of people, get them all on the same page effectively. But then it's all about getting them involved in real situations, in collaborative activities, getting them to practice skills. At the end of it, group discussion to really check their confidence, to make them present back what they've been working on. That's skills-led learning. Knowledge-led is, is pretty much fairly bog-standard e-learning maybe. Um, it's on your own pre-assessment, bit of instruction, followed by practice in scenarios. So it's certainly not as, as, as higher order. Other, other, so what, which technique should we use? You know, is there a definite yes or no regarding those two? Well, I thought maybe the, you know, if you think about driving a car, what does driving a car involve? Well, do I need to know the highway code? Do I need the knowledge to drive a car? Do I need to memorize road signs? No. I need to know physically how to use a clutch, how to brake. I think that's it's, it's skills-led. You know, with, with a skill, I could probably, I'd probably make a few mistakes, cause a few accidents, but I could drive. I don't need the, the underlying mechanics of how a, how a Haynes manual describes a car. But then again, if I was learning a language, what is that? Is it a skill or is it knowledge? Well, we, knowledge is the grammar. With grammar, I can communicate. I don't necessarily need to do it perfectly. I don't need to understand dialect and the nuances of different tenses, etc. With basic knowledge, I could get by. So I think it's very, it's very domain specific. So applying that more to the workplace, um, what do we do? If we had knowledge first and add skill to it, what, what, and how, how do those two differ? So if, if I add skill, but I, I can add knowledge to it by talking about what I do in a very skillful way, I can I very much describe the subtleties of the skill as well. But also, most importantly, I can pass that on. So that's if I have skills first and I add knowledge to it. The other way around, if I've got loads of knowledge and then I try to move that up, to scale, up the scale to become a skill. I can probably discuss the skill in a, very, in a very precise way. I can add to my knowledge probably more easy because that's been my method of learning. And I can obviously apply that knowledge as well because I'm very confident in, in my expertise. So there is, again, domain specific possibly. I tried to think of a real example here of, of that sort of knowledge and skill it, something that I've done in the past. I mean, how many people can read music here? Not very many, okay. How many people just picked up an instrument and just played it? Okay, so yeah, it generally, people do it one of two ways. 
in my case, I, I used to work, uh, work, play in a band. Um, I never had any lessons, just picked up a guitar, learned to play it. The bass player who we used to play in the band, he had jazz bass training. He was a, almost semi-pro. The interesting thing was, when we were practicing, we got to points where he, we'd he'd stop and say, whoa, whoa, how many Ds is it until we change to A? And I had absolutely no idea. So, well, it's just when it feels right. I mean, and it's interesting. He, he, ha he had to know the mechanics of what we were doing. I wasn't interested in that. I was more interested in just the flow, and it, it just felt right. So I think this is quite interesting. I think that really summarizes that skills, knowledge things quite well. In Knowledge is very mechanical, and, and I think people with knowledge don't necessarily know how to, how to kind of be more flexible in the use of that knowledge. If you approach a, a topic from a skill direction, I think you can be a lot more adaptable in how maybe you haven't got the knowledge, but you can probably improvise a lot more. I mentioned about skills development being, being context-specific. Um, I've just taken two examples here from more in the corporate space. Um, because this, this report by Tony Bates just sort of indicate that we need to think about skills in a very domain-specific way and embed them in very much a knowledge domain. What are the icons? Well, if we think about medicine, wh where's medicine coming from in terms of skills development? Well, it's, it tends to be very deductive. You know, we deduce things from symptoms, from a range of symptoms, but we're quite cautious about risk. So in, in the decisions we make, we, we tend to be quite, you know, we have caveats in there. I think business skills are almost the opposite end of the scale. You know, often we've got very scant information. Our decisions are very strategic. Um, we don't know stuff. We just have to kind of go with our gut feeling. And we take risk. We do take risk. We invest here, we invest there. We recruit here, we recruit there. So very different knowledge domains. And this, so the knowledge domain, the knowledge required might be similar in many ways, but the skills are very different. Um, so I think, yeah, we've seen some differences here. So this is how we might want to teach those. So moving forward, um, again, another bit of the report from, from Tony Bates. He tried to identify what he believed were the, the skills that future workers in this world that we find ourselves are going to be. I put in bold what I thought were the were some of the important ones there: thinking skills, thinking on the fly, um, and digital skills as well. The ability to operate in, in a really wide variety of media and formats, but also knowledge management as well. You know, knowledge is changing so much. I need the I need the skill to be able to dispense with some knowledge and add new stuff and recognize when knowledge is out of date. Steve Wheeler took the sort of the digital skill a little bit further and coined the phrase digital wisdom, which I quite like. These are the skills that he perceived that the, the knowledge workers of today need to do their job. So based on that, that fact of only needing 5% knowledge in my head, what skills do I need to go and find the extra stuff? Some quite nice things here. I mean, social networking, yes. Managing my privacy, you know, not exposing myself to um, uh, st stuff which I don't want other people to know. And that's a really important one. It's become, becoming more and more imp important. Creating ident an identity online through lots of different channels. Creating content, reusing it, searching for it, curating content. Presenting my, myself online in, in, a, in, a, in a, an effective way so people know what I do, what skills I have, where to go to find um, that information. And transliteracy, I think, summarizes everything quite well. It's the, the ability which you see kids doing where they, they can multitask on different devices at the same time. So, you know, I can upload a, v a video to YouTube, I can tweet. I, I know what these channels mean, I know how to use them in the most effective way. Um, I can almost multitask in any of those and whatever new ones are going to appear in the next few years. Steve also talks about this um, concept of strategic learning. I think this links knowledge and skills quite well. Um, surface le learning, I guess we can think of that more in the skills arena. Deep learning is the deep knowledge which I need to retrieve. So strategic learning is the ability to pull out deep learning in, into, into my short-term memory to use it as and when I need it. But going the other way, when I'm performing a skill, I need the ability to say, hang on, this is new knowledge. 
I need to store that into deep learning. So that's quite a nice concept as well. And can we, can we facilitate that? Can we help learners manage that process in what we actually deliver to them? But there's something else getting in the way here. I think it's all about attitude. Um, again, personal example, I mean, gentlemen, I mean, I know many of you know how to stack a dishwasher. You've got the knowledge, you've got the skill of when it needs doing, but you don't do it right according to your spouse, do you? You always stack things too tightly. You put trays on top. It now, what's going on there? What's the problem? Well, it's attitude, isn't it? My way's best unfortunately, um, and my partner does chastise me quite commonly about that. Attitude is the big stuff that's hidden away. It's the 80%. Knowledge and skills may well be sitting in, in view there, but there is something else that we need to cater for. You know, we're throwing more and more stuff at our learners. Are they becoming resentful of that? And how are they going to feel about being presented with more and more information? How can we deal with it? So the last bit really was just maybe a bit of a look forward to learning design and how does all this stuff we've been looking at affect how we need to design our e-learning courses, our learning interventions, whatever they are. Well, I've always been really keen on, on motivation as being one of the key aspects of doing whatever we deliver. I mean, it goes back to 2009, this study where you know, really is one of the most important factors in successful instruction, whatever format we're delivering it in. A more recent study by, by Shunk this year, actually, he built on something which is called the ARCS model, which you might be familiar with, um, to, to, to really promote motivation amongst learners. He identified these four factors of what he called intrinsic motivation. We need to constantly challenge people. Challenge creates interest. It creates motivation. It creates engagement. You know, whatever we do, you know, we need to keep pushing people hard. What we're trying to do is make people become independent learners because that's what this digital wisdom is all about. Um, so it's really important we do that. Curiosity as well. You know, based on the knowledge not being necessarily in one place, we need to create curiosity amongst learners to make them go and find more stuff. How do we do that? Well, we don't tell them everything. Um, we, we try and make them think about, I want to know more about that. I want to seek understanding. That doesn't quite agree with my mindset. My knowledge might not be quite right. I need to resolve that. How can I do it? Well, go elsewhere. So curiosity. Open up the doors in terms of control as well. Again, it's catering for this always-on generation. You know, give me control about what the, the way that I can learn. Um, let me go wherever I want to. Um, let me regulate my own learning path as and when I need to. And you know, a lot of skills development is based on simulations. And we all we talk, we talk about authentic simulations in e-learning quite a lot. And I think it. It's a bit of a cliche, really, but are they, are they actually ever authentic? You know, do we actually, when we're putting an e-learning course, often we maybe put three simulations together or scenarios and think, well, that's enough. But when learners approach this, do, do they actually really, truly recognize one of those as being relevant to them? Do we need to rethink how we do that? I mean, one thought I had is, can we actually allow learners to build their own simulations to actually from a series of parameters? You, you put this together as, how, as, you know, as you've experienced it and then work through it. You know, really try and extend that control, that challenge, that curiosity. Make it as real as you can. Building on that, you know, skills development, and Steve Willis, uh, he, he built on someone else's research here, but he talks about what he calls the flow channel between boredom and anxiety. There's a lot of um, academics um, believe that people in an anxious state are the most receptive to learning. If you think about revising for examinations the way back when, it's when you're really anxious that you really learn. Um, you really learn fast. Um, so the challenge is, is the anxious um, axes. The skills can be perceived as a little bit boring. That's what I need to do in my work. But if I push too hard on the skills, people are going to get bored. So can I maintain them in this, in this state of, of, of flow almost between being a little bit fearful of what I'm doing, but 
dipping into the skill every now and again. So that's quite a nice thought, I think, to, uh, to kind of base our, uh, you know, it's gaming theory, effectively, you think about games design. And this is a really fascinating study, which I'm um, not sure if you came across this. I think it's probably last year, if not the year before. Um, Bilton and Gluck, they, they came up with the concept of failure-led space de-learning. You've probably heard about the, the, um, the success of spacing learning out over a period of time. These guys did a really quite a substantial study where they wanted to analyze the effectiveness of three different types of learning intervention. So it was around um, phishing awareness training. So the problem was people receiving emails with attachments, opening up and infecting the whole infrastructure. They, they got 500 employees over a period of nine months. They created three courses. One was a placebo, so it had nothing to do with um, phishing awareness at all. One was just a page turner, like a wiki. And the other one was good old interactive e-learning. So they all had that training at the start in three groups. Then at three-month intervals, they were then subjected to a blind test. So they received a test and say, right, how would you respond to this email? Is this a phishing, um, you know, does this need to be flagged as a, a potential phishing email, yes or no? If they got it wrong, they got on-the-spot remedial training. The results are quite astounding. As you can see, uh, the type of training people really, um, receive was absolutely irrelevant to the success they had. What made the big difference was that remedial training at the point of need. I think this is, is, is a really powerful technique. You can imagine implementing this is going to be more complex, but in terms of um, skills improvement, as in giving people skills and knowledge when they failed, when they are anxious, you know, the results speak for themselves. So give that some thought in terms of skills and knowledge development. I'd like to end on this, really, before I show you a little video clip to finish with. Um, Harold um, Yarki put this together, which I think illustrates where, we've, where we were and where we are now in terms of corporations and how we work. Before the 19th century, you know, there were artisans who had apprenticeships, very much freestanding. Um, there was definite knowledge base that apprenticeship, apprentices needed to acquire to do that job. But then another apprentice could come in and learn exactly the same knowledge base and do the job equally as well. Industrial Re Revolution, we had corporations where skills and knowledge were passed down from the top, very much in a hierarchical manner. What we're dealing with now is the so-called solo mo situation, social, local, mobile, where it's all about peer-to-peer -peer communication, as we know, um, learning from each other, learning from people up, down the tree. It's about um, being very much a freestanding learner. So in terms of knowledge and skills, how does that fit into this? I, from what we've seen and from what I believe is that it's so intricately intertwined. I don't think we can separate them. I think they've both got value. It's very much domain specific, as we've seen from some of the examples. To end with, I'm going to show you a little video clip. Going back to the navigational theme, this is potentially uh, the navigation device of the future. If you're a little bit squeamish, I'd close your eyes just before he opens the car boot. I've got you anxious, you see. Hello, Catherine. Where do you want to go? It knows me? Yes. A new technology. Cool. Please turn right. Keep on the left. Please turn right at the traffic light. Right, no, uh, left. Try to go straight. Uh, wait. Sorry. Sorry, let me concentrate. Stop the car. Please, stop the car. Stop the car, Bob! Lord! Sorry, Bob. Sorry about that. I quite like that. Thank you very much. That's me. Um, I'll give you a link. to the talk there.
Um, I'm from MindClick. We've got a stand over there. I'm happy to take any questions if you want to pop up here afterwards to find out more. But I um, hope you enjoy that. Have a nice show.